So welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is a, a particularly welcome um, presentation. Uh, the department has uh, for over a year uh, been working with uh, Dr. Roberts to, uh, to, to join us here at Penn uh, to speak about her research. And we're, we're very happy to finally be able to host her, um, albeit remotely. Um, anything pre-COVID at this point seems like a lifetime ago. And indeed these discussions uh, began over a year ago. Um, so um, uh, uh, welcome, uh, Andrea. So good to have you with us. Uh, thank you thank for, you for having making, me. making the time. Um, so let me begin with a brief, uh, brief bio and then um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Roberts. Uh, Dr. Andrea Roberts is an assistant professor of urban planning and associate uh, director of the Center for Housing and Urban Development at Texas A&M University. Uh, she's the founder of the Texas Freedom Colonies Project, a research initiative documenting forgotten Black geographies, placemaking history, grassroots preservation practices, and contemporary planning challenges on an interactive atlas. And that link, by the way, to that atlas um, is in the email announcement for tonight's talk. She engages methods associated with the urban humanities, counter-narrative development, critical race and black feminist theory and, and action um, research to address systemic planning inequities. Her work is published in the Journal of Planning History, Journal of the American Planning Association, Buildings and Landscapes, and the Journal of Community Archaeology and Heritage. Uh, her talk tonight, as you can see on the screen, um, is the planning, uh, is the Freedom Colony uh, repertoire, promising approaches to bridging and bonding uh, social capital uh, between urban and rural black megas. So with that, I will turn the, uh, the screen over to Dr. Roberts. Uh, and again, welcome, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Unmute, that's helpful. Thanks again for having me, and I'm really excited to share uh, this work with you today. Um, I'd like to begin by going ahead and letting people know what it is I'm trying to get across tonight, uh, rather than you wait for the end and wonder what the point is. So uh, this, is, this is what I intend to show you, uh, that African-Americans um, diasporic multi-site citizenship is understudied in planning and preservation. And that descendants, descendant communities live in a state of adaptive liminality. And that means existing between rural and urban black meccas of opportunity. And these are spaces of opportunity for those with diasporic citizenship in multiple places. Uh, empirical ethnographic research reveals diasporic networks, cultural practices. That's a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you is that ethnographic research. And that's indicated that there is what I call a repertoire, or rather I borrow from performance theorist Diana Taylor, who talks about the archive and the repertoire. So we're talking about a repertoire of cultural practices rooted in cultural performance that catalyze return attachment and participation in planning, revitalization and preservation practices. And that planners and preservationists should seek ways to leverage this repertoire of those living in a state of adaptive liminality when engaging diasporic community. And so this work that I'm sharing with you today is a combination of uh, an article that I published uh, late last year, early this year in the Journal of Urban Affairs um, as well as a book in progress called Never Sell the Land uh, that I am working on for University of Texas Press. So there's a few elements of the presentation. Uh, I'll be talking, of course, about these Black geographies known as freedom colonies, interchangeably known as freedmen's communities, freedmen settlements, Black settlements. I'll talk about uh, the specific context or landscape um, in which I did my initial research. I'll speak some about social capital and this bridging and building social capital specifically. And then 
I'll share some findings and lessons around this concept of the repertoire and this concept of adaptive liminality. And then I will share the ways in which all of that research and those lessons inform the work that I do with the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. But first, uh, I want to ground um, in a few uh, ways. Uh, first of all, I am speaking to you uh, from Bryan College Station, the home of Texas A&M University, which is on Tonkawa and Santa tribes uh, land. And I also come in the spirit of uh, my great grandmother at the top there um, and my grandmother at the bottom. Both of them are standing in historic African-American settlements in Houston. At the top is Riceville Community and at the bottom is Independence Heights. So I, my study of these places is, is somewhat intimate. However, um, I didn't really know these as significant historic African-American communities until much later in my life. Uh, and I'll talk about why some of that is the case. And uh, I also have some picture here about the nature of the life I and life experience and professional life I had before I entered this work, uh, working in African-American communities. And that was working both for the city of Philadelphia, actually, where I was a deputy budget director of performance evaluation. And then for the city of Houston, uh, I assisted with the community development block grant uh, pro process, as well as tech in increment zone uh, financing. And so the accumulation of those experiences really frame the approach to my work in African-American communities. Uh, because of what I witnessed um, as both uh, professional as, and as also through some lived experience. And what I witnessed was some operating assumptions that I found troubling or problematic. And these included uh, the idea that to be a planner or planning practitioner, you should be most concerned with fighting the gatekeeper. Uh, who is the easiest to manage? What is the, who is the easiest person to have a relationship with? Um, otherwise known as the token. And these, you know, I'm sure all of you have read Arnstein's Ladder. So you're, uh, uh, you're really well, you know, versed in, in that category of what that means. Uh, that all African-Americans live in blocks and corridors in inner cities. That when you say the word historic about a community, it's about a glory of the past, but it's not relevant to the present in that your interventions in these landscapes are primarily about memorialization. Uh, and the aesthetics of these communities are always assumed to be lacking in some ways or that they are covering up the glory of an earlier age of uh, greater integrity or the original historical significance. And there's a tendency to look for the one size fits all approach to addressing any of the challenges in the community. So very generally speaking, uh, this is a lot of what I encountered in my work um, until I entered my doctoral research and become, became really fascinated with these places called freedom colonies. And I'll tell you honestly, I didn't come to this work thinking specifically about freedom colonies. I learned about a mutual aid association and uh, through learning about this African-American Mutual Aid Association that preserved cemeteries or that founded cemeteries during the progressive era, I found that my family uh, founded one of those and was interred in those. And after learning that, I then figured out that we were from a number of freedom colonies. So what's the significance of this other than interesting family history? Uh, there's a lot of significance to this question of black placemaking that I find relevant in a number of ways, but I'm principally interested in uh, this work from the perspective of someone who I consider myself an African diaspora uh, or African American diaspora scholar in some respects. And uh, Leon LaRoche and um, Bubber say that uh, scholars are concerned with diasporic survivals and adaptations but also are rightly concerned with the vehicles for freedom and independence. Escape is one thing, but how did maroon and free communities rationalize or conceptualize freedom and institu institutionalize self-government? And these are the questions that really fascinate, fascinate me as I think about 
these early African-American communities and the conditions under which they were founded in which these, these recently or formerly enslaved people um, had to contend with circumstances that in some ways you might not be able to imagine and in other ways we can, unfortunately. Uh, but in many ways we can't. However, they, will, they were able to eke out some semblance of freedom. So when I speak of these communities, just to give you, uh, just to differentiate and give you a framework for the types of places that I'm speaking of, some examples are here on the screen. We're of course familiar with uh, uh, Seneca Village, which is uh, where there's a nice little park there. You may have heard of it, it's called Central Park. Uh, there was an African-American settlement there. Uh, Rosewood, Florida. Uh, Eatonville, Florida, Nicodemus, Kansas. So these are places intentionally founded, pl platted, incorporated places, towns. However, Texas freedom colonies have a wider variety of geographies that they encompass. So they're generally founded between 1865 to 1930. Uh, these are clusters of landowners um, they came to own the land primarily through squatting or adverse possession. Uh, there was a 1866 uh, Texas Homestead Act. However, due to the state legislature passing what were called black codes, there was not, however, um, African-Americans were not permitted to take advantage of any publicly available land. So they were not part of that Homestead Act of 1866. And so they were you know, using adverse possession, going to report that they had made positive use of the land to courthouses and often had to avoid that because it was very dangerous to let lots of people that you know if you were African-American holding lots of land. And the quality of the land was primarily in areas that were you know, near railroads, mills, and, and what people proverbially uh, call the bottoms, flood prone areas. And so what's interesting and significant about these clusters of landowners, if we think about the rural ones, these were not only rural communities, uh, but they were mostly rural communities. These landowners in 1870, they accumulated uh, nearly 2% of all farmland in Texas. However, by 1910, they had accumulated more than 26%. Uh, and some uh, say as high as 31% of all farmland in Texas was owned by African-Americans. Today, nowhere near that number. We barely get anywhere near one to 2%. Um, so this was significant in that we were able to, or we figured out ways to accumulate this capital under these circumstances. So uh, the historians, uh, Sitton and Conrad, called these dispersed communities, settlements, places unplatted, unincorporated, individually unified, only by church and school and residents collective belief that a community existed. And I'm most fascinated by this idea of, a, of residents collective belief as the foundation for place. But of course we know a lot of things, a lot of forces um, acted against these communities being able to flourish. I, I mentioned racial violence, um, in dispossession, uh, but for those that are closer to the city core, I'm using here an example of Houston in the 1920s and 1950s, because they're both um, maps uh, from the city that are showing uh, the effect of annexation. Uh, they annexed the city, what was the city of Independence Heights. So I mentioned that uh, settlement in the beginning, Independence Heights was its own independent town with a mayor. Uh, and it was annexed. And then by the 50s, you had several more settlements that were annexed into the city and were then conscripted to the designation of neighborhood. Uh, so that included Cashmere Gardens, Pleasantville, Sunnyside. All of these were independent, intentionally founded communities, not ghettos to which people were pushed. That's the distinction. The other threats besides uh, government or racial violence, and those that persist today are uh, threats that I put in three categories, vulnerability, access, and visibility. So the map that you see here 
uh, the concentration of green on the map is depicting areas where there is a concentration or the highest concentration of freedom colonies that once existed or still exist. So if we are looking at this by county, uh, we see a number of counties that also are green and, and have these red stripes across them. And so the red stripes are indicating that these were areas that were uh, FEMA and governor designated disaster areas after Harvey. And so this is another way to look at the contemporary legacy of having founded these areas in bottom land. Yes, the entire Harris County in Houston was inundated, but we know about the disparate impacts that communities of color have had with um, recovering um, and also uh, being able to uh, you know, build new homes or, or stay or remain in place. They haven't been able to. The other is a lack of infrastructure. Uh, very often there were a series, I'm sure all of you learned in your planning and preservation history uh, during the 1910s, the series of zoning acts um, that were then ruled unconstitutional. And so a lot of cities would go to uh, different planning firms and architectural firms who would come into cities and draw up a section for a distinct Negro district. This is the case in Austin, for example, which is why you have East Austin referred to as an African-American enclave, when what it was was an African-American area to which African-Americans were told, if you live there, you'll have a separate but equal existence, meaning we will have recreational and infrastructure and other facilities there. But if you continue to live elsewhere, that is in the settlement, the 16 settlements throughout the city, you will not get resources and we will not give you running water. And so this is the case here in Sand Branch, Texas. And this is an article uh, from a few years ago um, in The Guardian about that community. And then you also see at the bottom, Independence Heights, which has had intense development, some of which is invited and some of which um, has been obstructive to uh, property values um, and to uh, the settlement pattern and it's been a, a destruction of a lot of historic homes. And it's also endangered by the coming I-45 project. So that's emblematic of what happened to so many communities is being divided or endangered by uh, infrastructure projects, particularly uh, Department of Trans Transportation projects. Um, so I showed you those reasons for the decline, but I became, over the course of doing my research, I was told about settlements in an area that we refer to in Texas as Deep East Texas. And that designation is both cultural and also governmental in that there are metropolitan planning organizations or council of governments. And for this region, it's called Deep East Texas. So it's the sort of the Eastern portion of the state on the way to Louisiana. In this landscape, I wanna uh, share a little about it because it so informs uh, the nature of the work that I did in these communities and also confound some assumptions about African-American communities and their ability to adapt and, and rebound in the face of racial discrimination. And so this map of Texas has a little section that's showing you two gray areas, which are Jasper and Newton counties. And you'll see a water body, that's the Sabine River that divides Texas from Louisiana. And here we see that these two counties are very much regionally uh, on the way to the South and, and very culturally the South in many ways. So this is also uh, an interesting area historically. And what makes it interesting is that this is an area uh, that was always in dispute. Uh, you know, it was at a time known as the neutral ground Another Spain or the United States would say, this is my land, or they had certain section which they uh, refer to as the neutral ground. Um, and in this neutral ground, there was a lot of piracy. There was a lot of um, outlaw kind of existence. And it was also a place to which interesting people migrated. A lot of people are confused by the fact that people migrated from other areas of the United States to Texas during slavery, but that did occur. 
And the people who did that migration were referred to interchangeably as Melungeons or quote unquote red bones. And these were people who descended uh, are said to have descended originally, they were in the Tidewater states and descended from the original uh, 20 enslaved Angolans traded with Jamestown, uh, Virginia by uh, leader John Rolfe in 1619. And so these people eventually would intermarry uh, with whites and would often pass for white, move uh, down to the Tidewater states and then move down pre-1840 down to Texas between 1825 to 1840 before the Republic of Texas actually passed prohibitive laws that said African-Americans couldn't own land or own themselves. So there was a few African-Americans who were able to live there freely for a time. And these Melungeons that moved down to the area um, lived in this neutral ground area. And by the 1830s, uh, the Melungeons were primarily in Louisiana, left and then migrated uh, to the swamplands of Newton County, Texas, in an area not just known as neutral ground, but no man's land. And there's significant documentation of this that uh, kind of grounds that is somewhat ground truths the condition of this area um, a little later in time, but it, it does ground truth it to some extent. And that is uh, a journey through Texas uh, by Frederick Law Olmsted in which he recounts his trips through Texas. And he says that this county has been lately, and he's referring to Newton County, the scene of events which prove that it must have contained a much larger number of free Negroes and persons of mixed blood than we were informed on the spot in spite of the very severe statute forbidding their introduction, which has been backed by additional legislative penalties in 1856. Banded together, they've been able to resist the power, not only of legal authorities, but of local vigilante committees, which gave them a certain number of hours to leave the state, the banks of the Sabine. And so we have a long history here uh, that I want you to keep in mind um, as I tell you about some of the, the African-American uh, stories, uh, origin stories of their communities. It's also a place in which you had several slave owners, um, several uh, slave holders that owned several people. So this is an example of sort of the top 10 slave owners. Um, and one of the descendants of those uh, Abram Sells and Jamestown community. And if we go to the present, this is the same context um, that people also call the Pine Curtain. Uh, if you're entering these counties, you're said to be going beyond the Pine Curtain because it's the third largest forested area. Uh, the big thicket is in this area. There are several lakes and uh, built reservoirs that actually in which whole communities were submerged. This is prior to NHPA, by the way. So it was much, a, a much easier for public projects to completely submerge uh, settlements. Um, and, and these are places where county roads are how people get around. And that is a picture of what it literally looks like at night down some of those roads and during the day. And still timber is a large industry. But what does that all have to do with this uh, study of social capital and the bridging and bonding social capital of these historic African communities called freedom colonies. Well, I, I wanna give you the terminology I'm working with before I then go into talk a, a little bit more about the freedom colonies in Deep East Texas that I worked with. When I speak of social capital, I'm talking about bonding capital, which are social ties that link people together with others who are already like them along some key dimension. But bridging social capital means bridging social ties that link people together with others across a cleavage that typically divides society. So bridging would be bridging across age, bridging across class, uh, bridging across, uh, in the case of, of, of my research, the urban and the rural. And also the other conceptualization here of the mode or the way that the bridging and bonding happens is through various types of cultural performances. And so I'll be referencing these in the examples of what I witnessed in the context of events uh, that I uh, documented during my uh, research in Deep East Texas, particularly in a community known as Shankleville. 
But the uh, various uh, types that I'll be talking about, I mentioned cultural performance, um, embodiment, that's uh, places or uh, objects or touchstones um, of, of knowledge uh, and information, liminality, which is a state of being betwixt and between structures and situations, and often is characterized as a time of um, insecurity, but also opportunity. And communitas, which is a sense of purposeful collectivity felt by a group of people when their life together takes on full meaning. And so uh, Madison Turner and Victor are all uh, performance theories, uh, theorists rather that inform my work. And my, my principal argument is that in witnessing these, I witnessed uh, a various uh, set of adaptive or adaptations uh, to the circumstance of being in between urban and rural and being able to um, engage in uh, cultural practices that facilitate communitas these, and liminality, these moments of opportunity. But as I mentioned before, I first went out to Shankleville Community, which is in, uh, in Newton County. Uh, I went to what was called the Purple Hole Pea Festival. Uh, Purple Hole Pea uh, brought to the United States in 1799 from Niger. Uh, and it's a cousin of the cow pea, also known as the cow pea and uh, the black eyed pea, and they just taste good. Uh, but this is a, a cultural festival that this community uh, started and the people who started this festival in 2014 did not live in Shankleville full time. They lived in Dallas, they lived in Austin, uh, they lived in Houston. They were descendants of the founders of this community. And my first entree into this community was at this festival. And to get there is a five hour drive from Austin, Texas, just to give you an idea of, of how remote it is in certain ways. And what drew me to this place was the ways in which their foundational story uh, really catalyzed a series of uh, relationships, actions, and outcomes. So the story that they tell of their origins is that there were two enslaved Africans in Mississippi, Jim and Winnie. And Winnie was sold away to her master, uh, in, in to, to a new master in Texas. Uh, and that new master uh, was somewhere in Newton County, was a, a slave owner, it's said to be the Ford family uh, of Newton County. And uh, Jim decided he was going to locate or he was going to find Winnie. So if you want to imagine uh, a man who was ran away, a fugitive enslaved person who lived um, off of and in the woods and swim uh, many great rivers to reconnect with Winnie, at the spot you see down there, that muddy area with the, the white um, uh, circle down there, that is the spring at which it is said that Jim hid so that Winnie, uh, when she heard Jim's special whistle, came out to meet him and brought him food so that he could survive in the cold spring. So she would hide it near the spring, which is ice cold, by the way. Uh, but nonetheless, a beautiful love story. But what's so interesting about this story is that it's told in several different ways. Um, it has some elements of um, truth and it's retold in different ways by different settlements. They, other settlements have some version of these um, tales of marinage or um, fugitive enslavement leading to new free black spaces in the area. And so the, the cultural performance that happens is the telling of this story in several occasions, one of which is uh, every two years during a family reunion at this spot where the youngest and the oldest are to recount the story together and engage in a libation ceremony uh, with a cup uh, to drink some of the water. Uh, they don't call it a libation ceremony, they just do that. Uh, and then there are other instances in which they recreate this story at this site of memory, right? And it bonds these people to one another who are not all related by blood. They have the reunion, they have an annual homecoming, they have other special events where people are part of social and uh, religious or church affiliated social networks in which they bond over 
knowing this story or being proximity of the people who are descendants of those who are saluted or honored in the story. So I learned of this, uh, as I mentioned before, I went first to the festival and then later that same summer, I went to Shankleville's homecoming. And what's significant about a homecoming um, is that again, it's an instance in which people return based on uh, not just biological um, relationships, but church, marrying into the family, uh, belonging to the same denomination, uh, living in the two county area, and this is a network cultivated through these social practices, one of which is this annual event, which happens in Shankleville. And it is an event that takes place over two days with music and food on the grounds. And when I say on the grounds, I mean, uh, it used to be literal eating in the cemetery, uh, but it is eating in the church. And what's unique is what you should note here is this bridging activity that's going on because all of these individuals who have leadership roles actually in the homecoming uh, event live somewhere else full time, but they're fully invested in ensuring that the Shankleville Historical Society operates, that there's stewardship uh, of the uh, cemeteries and that this event, which raises money for cemeteries every year takes place. But everyone is not necessarily full time residents. And so you have this bridging and bonding that occurs and the bridging happens as people commemorate a shared experience of the place. So there's people there since childhood who recall songs and hymns um, that they sang when they were, were younger. And it is a bridging, even though they live in different cities and, and time zones even, um, they bridge uh, their differences over that. And there's a bonding through this song and remembrance as there's individuals who visit from other churches who may have never you know, had any connection before to Shankleville, it's their first time visiting, but this is their way of bonding with this audience of people deeply steeped in this culture of the place. And so the cultural performance that occurs that's new that they've developed is in the context of two uh, new events, the scholarship competition and what's called a talk back. So the cultural performance here is that of public speaking. Uh, these uh, scholarship competitions are, are very, very significant in that if you've ever been in Deep East Texas in the, in the summertime, you know that it can be in excess of 100 degrees. There's not very much, much built environment or excitement and it's, you know, it's very hot and sweaty. And if you're a young person, it may not be the first place you wanna go. So we know that for communities to survive and for any of these practices to be meaningful, there has to be a memory transfer. There has to be these bodily practices as, as Connor didn't call them. They're, they have to be translated into something the next generation can take on. And the way that they've done that here is the scholarship competition says, come read a speech about Jim and Winnie Schenkel and what their lives mean to you based on a particular uh, moral character or aspect uh, or attribute. So uh, confidence or tenacity um, or honesty. And so they give these speeches and uh, they're evaluated by the audience. And then they uh, get scholarship money anywhere from 1500 to $2,000. And uh, three, three people do this, or rather three students uh, receive these funds for college. These two individuals at the table, one of which is still alive, which um, and one who isn't, um, they are the elders who begin the talk back, which is sort of like a town hall meeting. They pick a topic which is related to those moral qualities. And what's significant is they are bridging these great divides to talk about um, real everyday problems. In this instance, I witnessed them talking about social media and uh, television and the problems that they had, that, that people had with connecting with their youth. And so you had people from 18 to 85, all in the same room, standing up and speaking and saying what they thought. So it was pretty horizontal power different. The only people who really had the power and it was understood were these two elders in the front who facilitated the discussion and chimed in and talked about the value of eating together as a family or ways to manage uh, these challenges. So 
uh, it was a very practical adaptation um, that they were learning through bridging. And this in-between uh, is that of individuals who are in this space at one time producing this sort of communitas, um, but it's very liminal in that you've got young and old and people from Houston and Dallas and you know, major cities in addition to this small community, which has fewer than 50 households at any given time. But during homecoming, they have anywhere from 200 to 250 people in this small church. So I attended Shankleville's and it's sort of ground zero for the work that I did. But by attending these events and meeting other people during uh, these uh, homecomings, I was able to encounter uh, people associated with other communities, Jamestown and Pleasant Hill, namely. So this map you're looking at is the map that I began with when I started the research. This is how many people I thought were here, or rather settlements I thought that existed here. And so all of these in individuals uh, at the homecoming are taking up a cemetery offering, a moment of bonding and bridging, a moment of communitas, because everyone is here you understand it's a fellowship, it's a connecting and there's a cultural performance of walking up to give your money. And then as you walk back, you're saying, hello, I like your hat, nice to see you. So it's a bridging and bonding, but it's a very practical outcome of making sure enough money is raised here to sustain maintenance of the landscape and the cutting of the grass, the very, you know, and the opening and closing and all of the practical things necessary to take care of cemeteries um, and to manage them. What's significant is all of these individuals are from different settlements. So one week I'll go to this community's homecoming and next week I may go to another individual's homecoming. So they announce here each of their homecomings when they are where they are. So it's a network, it's an active network that's been in operation since the Great Migration, so some 75 to 80 years. And what's unique, again, it's a time where people in the in-between, again, come and bring um, a wealth of knowledge and also take something from the space. So uh, this individual here in the red is one of the first Black scientific science fiction writers. Uh, she wrote on the Star Trek staff and lived in Australia all her life found out she's descended from the Shankelvilles and showed up at their 150th celebration. That's diaspora. <laughs> uh, had she ever been there before? No, but she felt I'm now home. Um, and then there's individuals here from New York City that I met uh, that came this particular year, the 150th anniversary celebration. So it's a way of sustaining that attachment. And there's a bridging and a bonding through not just the storytelling, but the storytelling that happens while they're in their practice of doing what we call traditional preservation practice. So they rehabilitated um, their home, which is now in the National Register of Historic Places. This is the Odom family homestead uh, where the descendants of Jim and Winnie Shankle, the Odom family lived. Uh, it was born and uh, it was uh, built in 1922. And now, they are rehabbing it and they're sharing their memories and bonding and bringing in pictures so that they can rebuild the porch and reverse engineer based on the building practices of, uh, of A.T. Odom who lived in the house and who was a flu flasher and, cat and carpenter. So these cultural practices, I mentioned again, I went to these several different um, homecomings. This is one from Pleasantville. And this little sheet of paper with a little chicken scratch <laughs> is really important because it gave me evidence of what communities were coming to each of these settlements. And I could actually develop charts of the networks and the different settlements and who was showing up and who wasn't present. And sometimes only one person would say, I'm representing for Indian Hills settlement. And I want you to know that I'm here and that I represent for them, even though I'm the only one. And so there's this performance of place and this real embodiment of place that happens during these services. And there's people, again, she's from Arlington, Texas, and she has connections to three different, every time I went to a homecoming, she was there and somehow connected or related. But again, six, seven hour drive, uh, committed to coming back and forth for all of the events. And so uh, I met women like Gwendolyn Carter. She was able to sit down with me and actually recount the dates of all of the homecomings and where they took place, had taken place. 
And so this is all in her head. This is not written down somewhere or advertised. And so this was one example of this bridging the constructions of place into, into one place if we're able to actually document the time and the place where the reenactment of the place happens because in any other time, there may not be anyone at the settlement. So what did I learn from all of this? That these are very rhizomatic places. Uh, rhizomatic in that there's no beginning, no end. It's always in the middle between things. Uh, it, there's a nomadic sense of growth and propagation in these homecomings. Yes, they always happen, but you never know who's gonna come each year. Sometimes it's a different group of people um, and some people don't make it that year. Uh, it's alive beneath the surface of current development. And when I speak of development, it's of a lot of resource extraction in that area. A lot of bottling of spring water, a lot of um, cell phone tires, and uh, towers rather, and, and roads being built. And it's home to those who may have never lived there. So it's a very diasporic group of people in that they, they may have visited as children, but never worked there. And these are ephemeral events that remind us of the existence of the places and that the rhizomes nodes emerge and disperse at various points in time, the nodes being the embodied sort of leaders um, that remind you of the power of the place. And so this is essentially what I learned and then practiced or rather investigated um, in the rest of the communities that rather like Shankleville or these other communities, did they take their foundational story? Did it foster place attachment? Did it encourage participation? And did it catalyze planning outcomes? And in the case of Shankleville, it did. The celebration and social networks cultivated attachment and encouraged participation of people of varied ages. Um, and then that participation catalyzed real planning outcomes, the reinvestment in the landscape, uh, the uh, pursuing of recognition, cultural sustainability, even if it meant inventing new practices and new traditions, and this sort of sustained itself. And so I investigated across that area, um, and in the process I geotagged pictures, um, audio files, and I engaged in all of these practices to see if they were leveraging their core stories associated with place and the place origination stories with real outcomes. So it was performance ethnography as I've been sharing with you today, oral histories and interviews where I repeatedly asked the same questions. Who is, uh, you know, uh, what is the origin story? What settlement are you, settlement or settlements are you from? Um, what are the last anchor sites? Who is it um, that, where would you take people if you're taking them on the tour? What are the places that you would say are the most significant? Uh, so I had a series of questions that I was asking either in groups, individual oral histories, and as people were going through public and private archives. So I compared both public archives, which are National Register nominations and uh, uh, records of uh, state historical markers that would refer to places but never actually be accepted as official markers. Um, or the stories would be called old wives tales. So I was comparing this public and private documentation to these other forms of knowledge and going on walking tours and co-planning. And the co-planning um, involved a event in which I asked settlement um, leaders from all over the state to come and share their stories. And I did that in the two county area. So I learned that there were what um, uh, Antonio Gramsci calls organic intellectuals that perform what I call the repertoire. Again, uh, borrowing from Diana Taylor, who says that there's um, a bias toward the written and that life often happens more as a repertoire and that people happen and remember more in scenarios than they do in straight direct lines and written documentation. Uh, and so what I found is that there were people known as kin keepers who uh, documented place names and boundaries and genealogy and that they informed um, the, uh, they were people who kept the stories of places and care covenants and they also were often cultural workers who were the storytellers, the keeper of the traditions, the homecoming and re reunion presidents. 
and this sustained or catalyzed involvement in preservation, homestead preservation. In the case of Jasper County individuals I interviewed, land reassembly um, and cemetery stewardship. So adaptive liminality, what, what do I mean by that? It's a cultural performance um, and rather cultural performance is a means of adaptive liminality for freedom colony descendant communities. This adaptive liminality, we talk a lot, I just wanna pause and say, we talk a lot about resilience, but I think that um, too often we don't recognize the inherent um, ad adaptive qualities of African-American life and experience. And, and this terminology that I offer, I'm in some ways trying to speak to that. And adaptive liminality enables descendants to not only preserve what capital remains in rural meccas, but also to engage in bridging and bonding or exchanges or, or urban and rural knowledges. And from rural land, urban uh, freedom colony descendants gain peace. And in return, they create events and opportunities to bridge age and class divides. These events foster bottom-up self-organizational adaptive strategies that promote attachment agency and communal resilience. And these liminal moments expected to divide and con confuse actually yield a space of opportunity where knowledge transfer occurs. And I, I just wanna tell you a little um, before we go to question and answer about Texas Freedom Colonies Project because doing all of that research led to rethinking this map. And I rethought the map because I was able to record through all of that ethnographic research, geotagging pictures um, and recording and going on walking tours and drawing maps, I was able to see that though this map was the map I started with, this is the map of the two county area, according to the people who live in this community, according to some public and private archives, places that had fallen off of uh, Department of Transportation orientation maps. Once we put these all together, we, call, we found places that locals call black pockets. We found so-called new places. So there's a black footprint and a counter narrative of place that is very substantive and significant because when you say Jasper, people normally think of the dragging death of James Byrd because that's where it happened. And so there's in the wake of that, a complete erasure of the black agency that also co coexists with that extreme racism and racial violence. And it was out of this experience that I then started the Texas Freedom Colonies Project while still a student because I wanted to express that I was not doing a dissertation and leaving, but I called it Freedom Colonies Project because it was a commitment. And it was, it's an evolving social justice initiative. Um, it's already been described as what it is, but we as an organization do three things. We document these stories. We built an atlas and database to keep all of these types of data that are evidence of place. And we develop community-based resilient strategies via participatory research leveraging that data. This is the atlas. This is the front page. Um, where it says atlas version 2.0 is where you would press it and you would see the map. Tell your story is where people are invited to literally do just that and they can upload all types of materials. And so the purpose of the Atlas was to promote um, visibility, uh, to have a centralized location for the data, uh, to have a way to spatialize the intangible vulnerabilities by putting in layers, I'll show you in a moment, and to increase descendants and researchers access to the data. So when I say data, I'm speaking of the traditional types of data that we would recognize since it's designated places, NHGIS place points, USGS names, Texas Historical Commission listings of cemeteries, historical markers, US National Register, foundational information. And we did a reconciliation process to determine is this an African-American place that ever existed and cross-referenced it this way. And we get in material like you see there for proxy uh, places that are the last remaining edifices or, or structures left in the community. This is a copy of the survey I mentioned, and that's the atlas in different color dots. Let everyone know very transparently that some of this information that's generated through this Google 123 survey, some of this information comes from or has been crowdsourced. That's the red and yellow dots. 
The blue dots are those that we can vouch for as a research team. So we also have these layers. These are just examples of the layers, the Hurricane Harvey impact layer here, as well as the US census. This is a 2010 census. This is significant again, because you can see where there are accumulations of settlements, but very little African-American uh, continued uh, um, uh, residents in that area, which we're using to intuit about places we need to do outreach around land retention and land loss. Uh, this is another view of the atlas and you can add actual structures and buildings and points and stories and images and video. And so these are examples of things that are uploaded, maps, images, ephemera, and people tell us very detailed long stories. I'm not gonna read this, but I think you can notice that there are several locations and dates and directions. And so diasporic identity really drives, continue to drive this work because uh, the Atlas is really about finding an online home and expanding the capability to connect the dias diaspora back to place. And we're in the process due to the generosity of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the African American um, Action um, Cultural Fund, uh, we are able to expand the capabilities of the Atlas. So we're now um, introducing new layers, but also working with a contractor who's building a new app, as well as expanding the overall um, platform to encompass uh, ways for descendants to connect with one another and learning modules about land loss and those sorts of things. And we've introduced a new map layer um, that's used in cultural resource management reviews. It's an overlay of projects, Texas Department of Transportation projects in the next five and 10 years so that we can really coach descendants on how to be more proactive. And so the network, again, uh, we operate, we learn from networks, we grow networks. These are people that we've had giving us feedback, working with my revitalization class, talking about the state of these, uh, of the Atlas. So we did a testing of the Atlas to figure out what needed to change. We still need paper surveys. We still need things that the older individuals wanted. So we started an adopt a county campaign where we're growing new small networks of individuals to work together on a county basis um, to aggregate information about place so that we can fill in the gaps of knowledge because we don't have a complete atlas. We have an ever growing crowdsource atlas um, that is not filled with all the information. That is, that is the work of the atlas. That is the work that we do. Thank you. Okay, um, virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was fascinating. So I'm mindful of time, but um, let's open it up uh, for questions. Um, Mike, if you would help me with this, um, we'll turn on the participants. Uh, you can either raise your hand or raise your virtual hand in the, um, in the chat box and um, we'll take some questions. Hey, Francesca. Hey, Andrea, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that Good wonderful talk. <laughs> Good to see you as well. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one, if you can help us place uh, what you've learned about the Texas freedom colonies in the context of freedom colonies elsewhere and how much, um, how, how we can relate that similarities and differences geographically. And the second one is methodological about the digital humanities and how much you found your website to be a tool of community engagement versus an archive and kind of a, you know, evidence of the legitimacy of the project. How much is it actually enabling you to connect with new people? And kind of that tab you pointed out about the tell us your story. How, how's, just how's that working yeah. out? Thank yeah, um, we've, we've had to get creative with that because uh, I will admit to some extent, I was very fixated on, we've got to get people to use the Atlas. We have tutorials, we have YouTube tutorials. Um, we have all of these tools and guides that we made to help people use it. But there are, our predominant age group of users who are most excited about recording this history are between about, I would say 35 and 65. And the 55 to 65, um, maybe totally computer literate, but there's something about the platform that is not absolutely comfortable for their use. 
And so then I had to concede that for some audiences, it was gonna, they were gonna be interested and really invested and love the Atlas. And then there were gonna be some audiences that just wanted to find some way to share information in a Facebook group and get some feedback about it and let them know whether or not, you know, is it true? Is it really a place? So um, I'm in a stage of where we're meeting people where they are. And part of that is conceding that. The other question you asked me about, well, and I will also say that during COVID, what's really changed is I have some millennials and generation Y, Z, whatever comes backwards. Um, <laughs> and they have some interesting approaches to engaging. And I'm just letting them, I'm saying, let's try it out. Let's do a monthly talk show with descendants and talk about a different topic. Um, and it, it seems to work pretty well. And then we have those recordings for people to go and learn about what we do. So there's ways that we're trying to sustain this relationship really with folks. That's not just about give me your data so I can put it in the Atlas or get on this Atlas, <laughs> you know? Um, it, it is to some extent, yes, it's an archive, but yes, people are engaging it. We've had, since 2019, we've had 82 uh, distinct uh, separate uploads of surveys. Um, and we have a group of classes that have been doing some data mining of some genealogy websites. So they're going to be putting a big bunch of data in there soon. So it's a process is all I can say <laughs> of this going back and forth. So we're changing from just, okay, get it in the Atlas to let's think about um, a catchy way to get people to want to record a video and send it to us. So we did a tutorial with the African American Library, uh, the Gregory School in Houston, where on Juneteenth, we did an event together of how do you record oral history on your phone. And so we share, they're a public entity, we're a public entity, so it's very clear, you know, the chain of custody of, of information and recording, so we can use the same conventions, and they, we share with them um, or rather they share with us people recording stories about places along with their recording about experiencing George Floyd and hurricanes and everything else from a, a black community perspective. And then the other is that I have a student who is really, really into all black towns. Um, I say into, I mean that that is her research area. Uh, and so the difference there is that these people were very, um, they wanted to be seen uh, they have uh, mostly totally incorporated towns. Um, and in Texas, there were many more people who, uh, due to the danger of, of saying, look, we're a bunch of black landowners, um, they were often in very secluded areas and didn't wanna be found. And that's part of what complicates being able to understand their history and where they are. And that's just one difference. And then there's just the general assumption about as I said in the beginning about black people in black places and the nature of our citizenship and stakeholdership that um, still confounds people and I guess keeps me in business. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hey Andrea, I, I have a question for you. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? A great presentation. Thank you so much thank for you. it. Um, so, uh, you know, being from Texas, you know, we know that a, a lot of the large cotton plantations were concentrated in East Texas. I mean, a lot of folks, black folks can trace their roots to that part of Texas. Um, could, in your like research, um, are, are folks talking about how they made community uh, in these places surrounded by all of this painful history and, and, and kind of also kind of thinking about the fact that, you know, the narrative around black migratory patterns, you know, Neil Irvin Painter and Exodusters and then Isabel Wilkerson and, and her work, uh, The Warmth of the Suns, they talk about people moving to escape uh -huh. violence. Yeah. Um, but can you speak to how these communities are made in place, uh, surrounded by all of this, you know, this pain that's um, connected to their histories? Yeah, a, a few things. One, the immediate decline, at, you know, after the Civil War of plantations. Um, while yes, a lot of them transitioned into sharecropping, um, but there were very active movements to counteract that, that situation. One of which was the development of these black communities, um, which were again, 
you had the plantation with the, obviously the best land and in somewhat close proximity, but often pretty far away, these settlements in the bottoms. So there was some, there was a, um, what am I trying to say? There were natural landscape barriers that they took advantage of um, that are less meaningful to us now, but were very meaningful to them then. Um, so that was one, one thing. And people, less than they tell painful stories, they tell, I would almost say excessively prideful stories, <laughs> um, overcoming stories um, and um, stories of greatness more than they talk about the pain and more than they talk about sharecropping. Now, while that was all the case, and you know, I, I think it's really interesting if you read Isabel Wilkerson's book versus the other migration um, about um, by Bernadette Pru uh, Bernadine Pruitt. Uh, I really highly recommend that book, but she's talking specifically about Texas and Houston and, and the, the flow of migrants from rural to, uh, areas to Houston. Um, she talks very much about the difference between, okay, it's one thing to say I'm in Mississippi and I'm going to migrate to Chicago versus I'm in uh, deep east Texas and I am going to, you know, go to Houston for opportunity in the 1930s and 40s, but I can get in my car and be back in east Texas in two hours, which means I can sustain that connection to place. And so the you know, there's not that distance that you would have that would make you kind of say, okay, I got to get the heck out of the South. I'm far away. Well, opportunity is two hours away. So I don't have to get out of Texas. You know, not that it's, <laughs> not that it was perfect in the cities, but I'm just saying, if you were going to migrate, you could always, you know, use this place as a touchstone, which kind of demystified the white surroundings. And when white people moved away, they still had their land. So it's, it's a, I think it's just, it's a little nuanced. I'm finding stories that are much more about the remaining institutions, um, the overcoming um, and the resourcefulness um, and relationships to the land. Um, that's what I'm hearing more of in the stories. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Others? Oh, okay. you're ready. Yeah, Randy. I'd rather hear Monica's second question, but I'll, I'll try to go really fast. Um, uh, Professor Roberts, this is just such a um, remarkable and, and clear and sophisticated um, presentation. And the research uh, just raises so many questions about uh, things that preservationists and the preservation field have taken for granted for a long time and, and the planning field for that matter. Uh, I, I'm really glad that you position yourself um, in both preservation and planning worlds, because uh, that they both need to, to hear the, these messages. Um, the, so I have a million questions, but the one that I, I'm kind of most eager to get your reaction to is that in, uh, within preservation, there's always been a, um, a kind of a discussion, uh, a not very useful product, uh, discussion, I think, about tangible versus intangible heritage. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of, they're not very useful terms to talk about a really important topic that, you know, the culture doesn't just reside in things, it resides, um, as, as you said, in, in so many other manifestations of the way people remember and live their lives and, and uh, transact and um, bridge and bond. I think you put so many beautiful words to it. Um, so uh, is, it, is it, am I over-interpreting um, what you're saying to think that this notion of liminality um, and the other, um, uh, the, the rhizomatic nature of, of these places, um, are those, do you, do you think kind of alternative ways of thinking about how to deal with intangible, what we'd otherwise call intangible mm. aspects of heritage? Um, because I think it was, it was really re remarkable mm. in a great way that you didn't talk so much about the materiality and the specific geography and, and form of the places and that and that and that that didn't seem like any deficit at all. So you know, I think you're you're really um, creating a kind of a, a new uh, compelling path to think about intangibility. Okay, this tangible versus intangible liminality thing. I like it. <laughs> I'm mean, gonna explore that more seriously. But what came to mind when you were just asking me that was the new report um, that just came out about preserving African American places and how toward the end of the report, it's talking about what preservation should be. And part of it is embracing all manner and types of 
preservation practice, including adaptive reuse. And so when I think about the tangible and intangible, I'm thinking about just sort of this disconnect from and this fixation on integrity and is it you know preserved in amber if not then it's no good and, and I'm, I'm saying that in a very extreme way just to get the point across but I think um, this issue of tangibility has to do a lot with integrity can I touch and feel the specific place and time and you know of what makes this place what it is what I decide it is um, from my authoritarian, you know, perspective of you know my authority, and so uh, when I talk about intangible and and tangible, it's not to say, oh look, intangible matters more. I mean, we need all the resources we can to support and rejuvenate Black communities and their cultural and financial resources. Period. But I do think this leveraging of the intangible is going to be key to that, and also uh, really embracing adaptation of place to meet. To, to meet people where they are in the community. So yes, we know that in the 80s, African-Americans took those beautiful churches and they were very proud to have amassed a building fund to uh, rehab churches and get new windows. And in the process, you know, there goes any types of integrity. Just the windows is one example, but there's other things, right? Um, and then what you have there though is a whole consistent congregation, however, that is consistently met at this spot for 130 years. Meanwhile, we're fixated on the windows. So uh, I just think um, it's really about a balance and also leveraging intangibility um, more, if that makes sense. But I, I am gonna revisit this intangible, tangible thing some more. <laughs> Dr. Roberts, I, I also had a, a, another question for you yes. um, related to uh, just the, the, the time period in which a lot of these towns were, were founded right after the Civil War. So, you know, so, so during Reconstruction, we see the, you know, the rise and growth of the Black church. Uh, we also see uh, the rise and growth of HBCUs. Um, yes. and, and so those, the, these, these uh, freedom colonies are a part of um, you know, this, the, this Reconstruction holdover you know, these tangible examples of what that moment could have meant for our country. Um, and so one of the things that I'm working through is like a lot of that reconstruction narrative is really centered in South Carolina around Buford. And it doesn't really expand as much outside of the, the limits of the, the state. Um, so in your conversations with the uh, Freedom Colony descendants, have they talked about um, or are there, you know, physical manifestations of that reconstruction period uh, that they left behind beyond uh, these towns and, and what that moment was like for them? Yes, um, the form that that takes is uh, normal schools and colleges. There were so many normal schools and colleges, and I'm not speaking of Rosenwalls, talking about in Shankleville, they had McBride College. So there was a explosion of local colleges and normal schools that people speak of and that they have almost no tangible evidence of. Like that's the most heartbreaking thing of some of this is, you know, someone brought out a book and said, this, these are school books from my great grandmother who went to McBride College. Beautiful like suede old books and, you know, carpenter instruction and all these things. So. Um, yes, that's the way I've seen it, it come up because ordinarily when we talk about HBCUs, and I don't think we unpack this enough, is we very often talk about, you know, um, and I do this in another talk about AMA, Missionary Association, a lot of, you know, um, predominantly white denominations that help start these schools. And so, yes, there's a lot of agency and it's intrinsically black and there's a lot of, you know, black pride and they have become black institutions. But at their inception, alongside those being developed were these homegrown places. And I can tell you on, on one hand, just a few of these places that still have a structure left that need our help. So that's what I hear a lot of people are like, why aren't you coming to help them with this lodge? Why aren't you coming to help us with this normal school or this local college that we built? 
in Flatonia, Texas called Farmers Improvement Society College, you know. Other questions? Mm. Dr. Roberts, um, thank you so much for a wonderful um, presentation. This is Amy Lambert, and I used to work for the Texas Historical Commission, so I'm, yes. I'm mildly familiar with a lot of these um, communities. But I wanted to ask um, how the rural communities like Shankleville or Pleasant Hill differ um, or, or are alike to more urban freedmen towns like um, Clarksville, uh, or Wheatsville in Austin, mm. for example, and because they're they're definitely facing different problems. Gentrification is um, is certainly something that's um, happening in Austin. Um, so yes. I, I want to know how these communities are reacting to that. I would have to say though that there is a thing called rural gentrification that's happening as well, and you know just and I'll get to the urban difference in a moment, but just to to be clear. Uh, what rural gentrification looks like is individuals who decide that that old Rosenwald school would be a nice hunting lodge and setting up and making it a hunting lodge. And John um, Hancock Insurance um, buying up large forest areas um, surrounding uh, the last few houses in a particular settlement. Um, so th <laughs> there's great kinds of massive displacement and dispossession happening in rural areas that we're not paying enough attention to that. Then the urban, what's the difference? I think that if you're in an urban context and you're from these communities, you do have an opportunity to engage in regime um, politics and urban regime politics. And if you can, can you know, if you can um, aggregate yourself into or people from your community into a group that can present itself as a voting block or a particular interest to an elected official, it's very different than in a rural area or unincorporated area where your your voting power is what whatever you know it's it's dissolved. So I think so. There's a visibility piece that you have um, in policy circles and ways that you're able to advocate for yourself that you don't have in rural areas as as much. Okay. Um, there's also yes, there's gentrification, but it's very different in different places. Um, when I was at UT Austin, where I got my PhD, um, and had occasion to see gentrification firsthand, um, I saw a lot of people, um, especially Wheatsville, Clarksville, I mean, the houses are over a million dollars, you know, it's, it, it's just completely any evidence of, of blackness in these areas is nearly gone. It's nearly gone. Um, Whereas in Houston, you still have lots of concentrations of Afri African Americans who live in particular areas who still are, you know, invested in those places. Um, it really differs by city, and so um, as much as yes, the gentrification is different in different places. I really am much more fixated on talking about just dispossession and displacement. Um, because gentrification often means displacement, but not always. And always keep your eye on the ball that the real problem is the displacement <laughs> and the dispossession um, more than anything else. And, and I think that's the challenge we need to focus on. We have a, a question from Jessica Baumert in the, um, in the chat and she had to leave, but le let me read it sure. uh, to you. Um, I'm curious uh, how ancestors learn about the on-site gatherings, fundraising events, other than by having the mm -hmm. information passed down by family. Is there a strategy for engaging descendants and in particular younger descendants to be involved in these gatherings and to connect them to these places? Yes, so uh, the festival does it a lot because it's a regional festival. So there are regional foodways festival in Shankleville, for example. So the things that go on there is a, there'll be a music concert. Uh, local TV from the nearest large city, which is Beaumont will come. You know, it is connected to civilization, so to speak. There are things happening other than um, those smaller gatherings. So there's that piece. Um, but young people are starting their own um, sort of aspects of the festival where they're selling things, 
Uh, they're having different contests. They have a beauty pageant. I mean, they're just putting all <laughs> this stuff that, that young people in that area, there is very little to do in Newton and Jasper counties in the way of entertainment. And so that's one way, new entertainment, new events. The other way in Jasper County, there's an organization um, in a place called Dixie Community. And this African-American settlement rehabbed a historic school. Um, and since they rehabbed that historic school and made it into a place for anybody to have a gathering so that they could afford to maintain it, uh, you can have your quinceanera there, you can have your reunion there, you can have any event you want there. But they also have a 4-H club that they've started up so that they could pass down some of these practices. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, vegetarians, but you know, how do you butcher a hog? How do you, you know, dress an animal after you kill it? You know, how do you do those things? Um, they pass down those practices to local kids um, who nobody is doing anything with really. You know, there's not a great, you know, girls and boys club in Jasper. You know, there's not a huge little uh, centers on every corner and there's no city council person or big political person to curry favor with to get all of those things as you might be able to in urban settings. It's hard, but you have these ready-made grooves to fit yourself in to pursue these things. And so the descendants I am meeting are stepping in to provide those in a real focused on youth, um, not just the 4-H club, but they're now they're looking at how they could inevitably do some job training. Um, that's, they, they're very, very clear on needing youth to be engaged and involved on a regular basis. Okay, last call. Anyone? Okay, Dr. Roberts, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to inviting you back for a look at the, um, at the project um, 3.0 um, in its next iteration. Yes. Um, I wanna uh, use the opportunity also to mention um, and to invite you all to join us on October 27th at 5 p.m. Um, Randy Mason will be leading a panel discussion on understanding civil rights heritage. Um, and um, uh, Randy, you wanna say anything about that? Um, sure, this is, uh, this is an event that is part of the launch of a new research center that we're, we're really excited about, uh, the Center for the Preservation of Civil Rights Sites that um, is in the process of building partnerships uh, to, um, to elevate and build the capacity to, uh, for, for communities and other partners to, and to do the preservation of, uh, of visible and invisible uh, civil rights sites in their, in their own communities. We have um, Brent Legs, who's now uh, joined Penn as an adjunct professor and advisor to our center, um, in addition to his, his uh, great leadership at the National Trust. Uh, so Brent will be joining the discussion as, as well as Quasi Daniels, uh, my colleague at Tuskegee University, the head of the Department of Architecture there, uh, with whom we've been working for the last year or so, uh, and Amy Freitag, uh, a Penn alumna and executive director of the J.M. Kaplan Fund. Uh, all three of them are advisors to the center, so we'll be, we'll be talking about their perspectives on uh, Black heritage and civil rights uh, preservation uh, and, uh, and helping to get the new center uh, word out about the new center. So thank Great. you all very much for... Uh, for signing up for that as well. Great, um, good. Okay, Dr. Roberts, we will let you go and probably go to your dinner. So um, I'm sorry we can't <laughs> offer you a reception. That's one of the downsides of remote, That's but okay. um, we'll make it up to you um, when things go back to normal. Um, okay. All right, so good night and thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. everyone. Thank you.